So a case. This goes back. This is a recent one. I could have quoted you several over the years. I'm going back almost to 10 years to the one that started us thinking, but this is a more recent one. This was from last Christmas. 80-year-old man had a fall at home or a collapse. You're never quite sure what happens. It had happened before. It wasn't unusual, but he couldn't get up. His wife couldn't get him up, so as they often ended up doing, they called the paramedics. He usually got him up, stuck him back into bed or back into his chair, and everything was sorted. The paramedics turned up, and they were a bit concerned. They thought, oh, his blood pressure's a bit low. But actually, that wasn't unusual either. He wasn't very keen on the idea. His wife wasn't very keen on the idea, but they'd said, you'd better go to hospital. The system kicks in. He ended up in A&E, as you do. Actually, once he got to A&E, they got a bit more concerned. He then had some melina. It's on a background of a non-steroidal and also a drug called rivastigmine. And the two can interact and cause GI bleeding. So on it went. A&E consultants involved had seven units of blood transfused and a variety of other things. Planned for an endoscopy. The endoscopy showed a big ulcer but no active bleeding, so a plan for interventional radiology to try and fix the problem. There are things we can do, so we'd better do them. I'll give you a bit of background, because this was about the point that I saw him. He'd had Parkinson's for about 20 years. Previously very fit and active, and it transpired he had never learnt to drive. He walked just about everywhere when he could. If he couldn't walk, he used a bike. If he was really out with the range of a bike, he might consider public transport. And it was only latterly his wife had learned to drive and he'd reluctantly had to accept that that was probably the way he was going to get around. As Parkinson had progressed, he was now wheelchair bound. Largely, he sat in a chair and didn't do very much. And he'd now developed a degree of dementia. He was pre-planned. He had a pre-existing care plan. He had a DNA CPR, he'd had contact with the hospice, and he had power of attorney in place. He knew what he wanted, and in fact had planned his own funeral down to the music that he wanted, and what he wanted people to wear. So his death was not going to be a surprise to him, and in fact, he, to him, it was going to be a release. So this wasn't something he was trying to delay. When I saw him, he was lying in a bed, very frail, barely responsive, in a fetal position, still having melina, and an ongoing pile of medicines and a plan for interventional radiology. What's the next step? What should we do? And I'll apologize, it's a big audience. If it was smaller, I'd get you to shout out some suggestions, but I'll make it rhetorical. Discussion with the family. What should we do? What's the plan, and what's the end result of it? and ultimately a palliative approach, and he died a couple of days later. Great. Sounds wonderful. Except that that discussion was instigated by his family, and the palliative approach was instigated by his family. Were those the correct decisions? Was that the right answer, and did we do the right thing? I think about that regularly. The reason being that that was my father. And I had to make the decisions. I had to find the medical team. I had to force a discussion. I had to force a decision. Now, I hold my hand up and say, I do this on a daily basis. And I have to go around and make hard decisions. And I made those hard decisions because it's what he wanted. But it shouldn't fall to me. We should be engaging people in those discussions. We should be involving the families. And we should be looking to them for guidance not to make the decisions. The outcome was the right thing. He spent most of his life active, but at the latter stages when he couldn't do things, it was a brief acute illness. Ideally, he'd have been at home. My mother wouldn't have coped with that. But he should have gone into hospital, been kept comfortable, and not had any of the things that were done. Forget the cost. Not interested in the cost. And I'll talk a bit about cost at the end. 
But what was right for him was not to go through a whole pile of things and swap between four different consultant teams in the space of three days. Little things matter, and I'll raise one last thing. For as long as I can remember, he listened to the New Year's Day concert broadcast from Vienna every New Year. He couldn't on the day he died, and he died about two hours after it would have ended. There was a television in his room, but it didn't work, and there wasn't a remote control. He couldn't have a radio, because of course that constitutes a public performance. And for that, we need a license of all things. So the one thing that would have made a difference to him, we could spend money in endoscopies, money on interventional radiology, money on drugs, but we couldn't spend 50 quid for a license for him to have a radio in his room. And actually, if you go looking, and this wasn't in Scotland, it was a big, fancy teaching hospital. The company that covers this waves it where it's for patient care. Not for a big group, but for individual, so you don't actually need a license. 